So uh, let me just mention how I start by deviating from the announced schedule, which I'm sure you have a copy that was posted on the internet. The first lecture, which is now, is going to be changed, and the first and second lecture will be combined, and that will be the following lecture starting at 11.30. So that will be a combination of the two announced lectures. Um, I don't envisage further changes. The reason for this change is a rather sad occasion for me. Uh, the day before yesterday, I put on the internet a farewell address, which you will all get a copy sometime during the day. But that's my topic now. The occasion was that we had a funding, we had the sponsor, Gold Standard University Live had a sponsor, which was uh, Sprott Asset Management Incorporated in Toronto, Canada. And they uh, have, uh, and Mr. Eric Sprott, who is the CEO of Sprott Asset Management, bearing his name, uh, took a personal interest in this. I must say that I did not solicit his sponsorship. I didn't even know him. When he came to me at a meeting in Yukon, Canada, with the offer. And so I graciously accepted, and it worked up until very recently when I got a letter from him stating that we were not attracting enough interest to justify that ongoing expenditure. So with that, the sponsorship and the funding was cut off. And then I was agonizing over this for a week or so and came to the conclusion that under these circumstances I won't be able to uh, continue because I was risking my very modest pension that the next meeting will attract enough people. Well, so far we have been doing very well. But who knows the future? I just cannot take that uh, risk myself. And um, it is with great regret that I am announcing, I have already announced on the internet, and I'm announcing it here, that after discharging all existing commitments, such as this one and another meeting scheduled for November in Canberra, Australia, we are going to discharge these commitments, but after that, I am not taking on any new commitment for uh, the reason that uh, we have lost our sponsor. So I decided to have a farewell address. This is the subject of our uh, morning lecture now. I plan to say a few words why I thought that Gold Standard University was needed, what we could do, what others do not do, and what we could do better, which others try to do but do not uh, come up to the mark. I also take this opportunity to just to show you the kind of difficulties I am and I have been facing is a quote from Wikipedia. I think uh, everybody knows, but could you just say in a few words what... Well, Wikipedia? Wikipedia, for those who don't know, it's um, basically an internet-based knowledge base that uh, people can contribute to on any subject. And um, the professor found uh, a reference to him under his name, which was I mean, uh, obviously it wasn't written by anybody in this room. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, now, uh, please do not take this as a disparagement of Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a living encyclopedia, which is something unique and something very needed, because you buy an encyclopedia, no sooner you uh, take it home, you realize that most of the, uh, a lot of entries are out of date. Now, Wikipedia is out updated almost on a daily basis. And this is a nice thing too, that they put a date on it, that this article is updated on such and such a date. So the article on my name was dated June the 9th, 2008. So it's not yet a month old, so it's <laughs> very up to date. This is what it says among other things. It should be noted that mainstream economic theorists criticize gold standard oriented monetary economists and monetary reformists, such as Professor Fekete, as fringe or amateur economists not worthy of serious study. That's written in it, not worthy of serious, serious study. So, ladies and gentlemen, you are wasting your time. Welcome to Survival. However, yeah, and it also has that Professor Fekete has never held a teaching position in an economics department of any prominent university. Well, one of the prominent universities in Guatemala is Francisco Marroquin, uh, university in Guatemala City and I did hold a teaching position there. So that's strictly speaking not true but I'm not arguing the point because it is true that my main background is in mathematics. I, I'm an amateur economist but I was made an amateur economist by default because those whose job was what I took upon myself was not being discharged. The, we are breaking taboos here, one taboo after another. These topics were chased out of university curricula. And that's a fact, uh, it's a, a demonstrable fact. So uh, that's the quotation. I must say that I find myself in a very good company. Because pre-1936 theorists of the gold standard are likewise dismissed by the mainstream as not worthy of serious study. So I am very happy to be in the company of giants like Adam Smith, Karl Menger, the founder of the Austrian School of Economics, Böhm Bawerk, uh, the second Austrian, very great man. He was also a politician, but an incorruptible politician. He was, was serving as the uh, finance minister of the Austrian-Hungarian monarchy. And um, according to one story, he was approached by the sugar industry. It was a big industry at the time in uh, the Austro-Hungarian uh, empire. They wanted to bribe him to impose quotas and uh, trade barriers and so on, and he refused. Well, there are many other stories of him, but he was a great man, not just as an economist, but also a politician, the kind of which we are badly uh, lacking today in the world, not just in one country. But there were Americans as well, such as Frank Fatter, Benjamin Anderson, and many others that could just go on and on. And I'm very happy in, to be in this company. I have tried to carry on their great tradition. And uh, I may have failed, but at least the intention was there, it, it was pure, and I have no regrets, I must say. 
I probably would have done most of what I have done exactly the same, even if I had known that we had to fold tent before we could accomplish what we set out to do. <clears throat> Here is another American economist who's dead. The name is Walter E. Spire. He served as the chairman of the Department of Economics at New York University from 1927 to 1956. He wrote an article in a weekly financial newspaper, new, newspaper I must, must say, in the year 1947. And among other things, he said the following. A deep, searing corruption has afflicted monetary science. It may require many years of painful effort to overcome this disease, if indeed it can be combated successfully. The well-being of our nation, meaning the United States, has been undermined by this affliction. I think you will have something to say how this, this prediction has come to by now, which was not so clear even as little as two years ago, but now it, the, the, uh, uh, the threat is very clear. When gold payments were suspended in 1933, and we embarked upon a sea of managed currency. A very large number of professors and organizations, and the list is attached to the article, urged a prompt return to a gold standard. The number of economists, remember that was uh, 60, uh, more than 70 years ago. The number of economists who signed this was 710. And the country was so much smaller, the United States. These uh, universities were so much smaller. Departments of economics were so much smaller. But the, uh, those who signed that uh, declaration demanding a prompt return to the gold standard in 1933 was 710. Plus there were organizations, uh, chambers of commerce, etc., etc. Now, did those 710 economists know so little about monetary principles in 1933 that they could not, a short time later, defend their earlier position? Or were they simply corrupted by a political movement which they found it inexpedient to oppose? There appears to be no valid defense that can be offered for men who pretend to be scientists, but who adjust their so-called principles in accordance with changing political tides. A very great number of those who pass themselves off as monetary, science, monetary economists either have not understood the lesson, lessons of past history or have been willing to junk them in the interest of expediency for such personal gains as they may have supposed they might realize. End of quotation. So this was Walter E. Spire, a very distinguished American monetary scientist who died in the year 1970, explaining the mainstream economics and its outlook on what we are trying to do. This war, they were paid off. They, they were muzzled either by bribe 
or by blackmail. And I leave it to you to decide which is worse. But this was not a natural development. That they, they found new principles, new avenues how to develop monetary science, and this just grew spontaneously, naturally, and uh, as a result, the theory of gold standard withered and died. That's not true. This wasn't the case. It was stifled, suffocated, and made to die. And I just leave, leave you with that thought. I felt it on my own skin, but I have seen it in any number of cases around me. Uh, one of the representatives of mainstream economics is Professor Jeffrey Frieden of Harvard University. I had a short uh, paper posted on the internet uh, which uh, was titled The Anti-Gospel uh, Message of Frieden. And in it was, uh, there was a challenge that I would be very, this was at the time when Ron Paul was still running as a candidate for the presidency of the United States. So it seemed to me that this was an appropriate time to issue a challenge. And uh, I picked on Professor Frieden because he just published an anti-gold manifesto at that time and I challenged him to have a public debate on the merits or demerits of a gold standard. Now, of course, he ignored me, but it so happened that uh, somebody who I didn't even know, but somebody who knew him, presented a copy of my challenge to Frieden, which then he could not very well ignore because he was a colleague and so anyhow he did answer in a personal email to me and he very haughtily said that there's no point discussing with people who have not read the hundreds or even thousands of articles which have been written on or about the gold standard since 1980, so in the past 28 years. Uh, and the suggestion was that I am completely unfamiliar, and he mentioned names as, uh, as uh, Barry Eichengreen and ben, ben Bernanke, the present uh, uh, chairman of the board of the Federal Reserve System in Washington. And he said there were hundreds of other contributors in between. Now, I felt that I just had to put it in here and put it on the internet, that I am familiar with most of that literature. I just took it upon myself to go through and read it and analyze it and uh, be prepared to have a participate in a meaningful debate on the various points raised by these articles. Now, I have not been able to find one iota connecting our crisis-ridden monetary system with the forcible removal of gold from the international monetary system uh, The year is 1933, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, confiscated the gold of the, and I might say unconstitutionally confiscated the gold of the citizens of the United States and put an end to gold payments. 
the consequences of this momentous decision have never been analyzed in an impartial way. Economists were told that this is taboo, should not be discussed unless you are introducing arguments in favor, in favor of it. And there was no discussion. This was just accepted as a fait accompli uh, with no analysis. And this is true to our days. We, I am willing to commit my reputation to that statement that we are among the very few, the gold standard university, very few who are breaking taboos and we go into that question, was it necessary? Was the gold standard dying a natural death or was it killed? Was it pushed out of the window? The Czechs have a word for that, defenestration. Because in Czech, this is one of the standard way of political uh, <laughs> assassination <laughs> to push the unneeded partner of the window so he can plunge to his death. Well, that's exactly what happened to the gold standard. It did not die a natural death, it was pushed, it was defenestrated. It's <laughs> a nice word. <laughs> it's a nice, nice word. word. <laughs> Now, rather than having a discussion on and a serious analysis of what has happened and how it was politically motivated, the gold standard is portrayed by those economists such as Ben Bernanke and Ian Green and many others. The gold standard is portrayed as an anachronistic monetary regime the removal of which was highly due and it was by popular demand. Moral considerations, sanctity of contracts, the honor of the government, the opprobrium of declaring bankruptcy fraudulently, the question of tormenting widows and orphans did not enter into it. Nor did long-term economic considerations such as the ticking of time bomb of capital destruction. The ticking has been going on ever since 1933. And we feel, and this is one of our topic at this meeting, uh, that the ticking is coming to an end possibly this year. And remember, I'm not brandishing big slogans about hyperinflation or deflation or this or that. I'm just simply saying capital destruction. This is what we have seen in the United States and other countries, but especially in the United States, as once flourishing and very healthy branches of industry such as TV manufacturing, uh, VCR, uh, and a lot of electronics and so on, have disappeared. Why did they? Don't blame it on, uh, on uh, uh, sweatshops in China or elsewhere in Asia. Don't blame it on them. Blame it on capital destruction. Their capital was dest destroyed. That's why they went out of business. And the next one, it can be seen, will be the auto industry in the United States. Once an enormously powerful uh, industry, which rivaled in power with the government of the United States, because one of the chairmen, General Motors, once said that United States, that's us. That's us like the Sun King, <laughs> yeah. Louis the, the, the state 14th. is me, I'm the state. <laughs> yeah, 
Le top. Le top. Le top. Le top. So the key word, and that's what I'm using, destruction of capital. And not just industrial capital. Not just industrial capital. Take financial capital. That's the surprise. Even I was surprised how quickly the uh, capital of the American uh, investment banks could collapse in a flash. In a flash. Bear Stearns. And, and now, uh, there is another long uh, line of names on the death list. And who is going to save them? So I'm going back to this literature which uh, Professor Frieden recommended into my uh, notice that I should, uh, should study it. Well, I have studied it. And I can say that the question is never raised how well the gold standard succeeded as the protector of savings and of savers how well the gold standard succeeded as the instrument of capital accumulation. And above all, the gold standard has succeeded as the stabilizer of the interest rate structure. So much so that there was absolutely zero bond speculation under the gold standard. And now you have to put layers and layers and layers of bond insurance on one another. The bond market is protected by bond insurance funds, but then you have to protect the bond insurance funds with the next layer, and then the next, and next, and it goes on forever. I haven't seen it anywhere in the literature, but ladies and gentlemen, I'm putting it to you and I have published it on the internet, that the derivative monster, which is now counted in over one quadrillion, which is one thousand, more than one thousand trillion dollars, nobody can explain why, where did it come from? Well, because interest rates were destabilized, the, thereby the bond values were destabilized, but the bond values are the main assets of the banks the world over. So you have to make sure that the banks can cut their risk or shift their risk around. So they created bond fund insurance and then another and another and another and I have explained why this is different from for example stabilizing grain prices or prices of agricultural products. The big difference is that the risks addressed by commodity speculation, speculation of in grains on the one hand and speculation in bonds or interest rate instruments on the other is that in the first case the risks were nature created. It's given, it's not man-made. We have no control of the climate, we have no control of natural disasters such as floods, earthquakes, etc. And therefore speculation is 
the last word how we can control the risks given by nature. And that's why it's successful. That's why it doesn't have to have a forever growing tower, Tower of Babel. On the other hand, the risks in the bond market are not nature given. They are not created by nature. They are man-made. So properly speaking, it shouldn't be called speculation. It should be called gambling because that's in the gambling casino is the place where people address risks created artificially by other men. And they are, this is an outlet for their gambling instinct. But don't confuse the two. And mainstream economics is guilty of confusing the two. They say these are exactly the same. One should not distinguish between the risks created by nature and risks created by men or governments, if you will, because that's just risks. And to address risk is speculation, and that will take care of it. Well, you see the result. The result, on the one hand, is a fairly well working system of controlling grain prices, especially under the gold standard. There was futures trading of grains and it was working very well. If today it's not working very well, don't blame it on nature, blame it on the currency system, which is working in a unit with a unit which is losing its value constantly and that creates additional risk introduced, man created risk introduced in the trading. But as far as the bond market is concerned, which is a very, very serious problem, we can say with confidence that the risks are just growing and growing and growing and there's no insurance system which you can build other than the Tower of Babel in the Bible. The people in their conceitedness thought that they wanted to build a tower which reaches to heaven and then they can overcome whatever limitations the human beings are <clears throat> working on there. This doesn't work that way. This world is not constructed that way. Because if you try to do that, you build a tower, it's going to collapse. And that's where the point where we are now at. So, the existing literature, in fact, not only doesn't help our understanding what's happening around us in economics and high finance. But it's a stumbling block in the way to impartial inquiry. The existing literature is in fact dedicated to the maintenance of status quo. And the status quo is the perpetuation of an immoral and this functional monetary regime, that of irredeemable currency. <clears throat> this is what has led me to found Gold Standard University, and that is my purpose, to be free to challenge the Keynesian and Friedmanite orthodoxy, which they are trying to use to control debate on that. So we don't have an open debate. I wish I could. We don't. So all we can do is just carry on in the setting of uh, uh, imitation of university lectures. Well, I hope it's a little more than just an imitation. I'm going to mention two topics, two broad areas of inquiry which I see that uh, could be properly discussed by Gold Standard University. And these areas have been overlooked by others 
I assume purposefully overlooked, but in any case there's no discussion and therefore we are filling a gap here, or we would, would be filling a gap here if we could continue our work. So these two areas is, one, gold and the theory of interest, and two, gold and the theory of speculation. I say a few words about each. First, gold and the theory of interest. The theory of interest, I'm sub submitting it to you, cannot be understood without understanding gold. And uh, as you know, the theory of interest has a vast, really and truly vast literature going back to Aristotle or even before him. So that's uh, at least 23 uh, centuries, possibly 25 or more. And you won't find a clear connection between the theory of interest and the theory of gold. I uh, would like to say this with due modesty that I am the first one who connects the two, who tries to explain the phenomenon of interest in terms of gold hoarding. Gold hoarding is, has been given a bad connotation basically by Franklin Delano Roosevelt who said that gold hoarders were public enemies and they should be deprived of their gold and the public uh, policy calls for uh, uh, government promises to replace actual gold holding. So let people hoard paper promises, which is so easy to say, sorry, we can't, can't perform on that promise. Things have changed. Climate has changed. All right. So if you want to study interest, the fear of interest properly, you have to start with studying gold and gold hoarding. So that's the first area. It's a vast area. And I am happy to say I, we made, made a good start on that. And we have no competition there. <laughs> we have a monopoly. But you can even squeeze a monopolist under our present academic system. You can just put them out of business. Bribe or back blackmail or both. I haven't been bribed, but I haven't blackmailed. <laughs> Maybe I'll be bribed. <laughs> I'm not looking forward to it. You never know. The second area is gold and the theory of speculation. Now, speculation is man's main tool to address risks which naturally exist in nature. And in fact, other than engineering, that's the only tool which human beings have to address these risks and to meet future consist, uh, contingencies. In particular, it's the Great Depression which we would like to understand. And all the explanations, the standard fare, which we get from mainstream economics is blame it on overconsumption, on the stupidity of industry to overinvest and blah blah blah. I have not seen a, co a coherent theory which explains the Great Depression in terms of speculation, especially speculation of the second variety, speculation on the risk created by man. The fact is that the removal of the gold standard has freed up 
forces, speculative forces, which were very destructive and no limit on the amount of speculation just keeps growing and growing and growing and even if it grows very very slowly after a certain time it will reach the critical mass and uh, it's anybody's guess when it will explode. Now, the theory of speculation covers such topics as arbitrage, futures trading, bases is, is perhaps the least familiar of these concepts, especially the gold and silver bases. For the purposes of our discussion here, is the basis is the difference between the nearest future price and the spot price. It's a very sensitive indicator, and you could use this to make certain predictions. Uh, much more successfully than any predictions on the price using charts or chart analysis. I'm not dismissing that, but I'm just saying that we have a, a more perfect tool to uh, predict the future outcome. And this is the basis. And related ideas such as contangle, backwardation, short, squeeze, and ultimately corner. Now, speculation is virtually ignored by conventional economic theory. I've perused dozens of textbooks and treatises on economic theory, looking up the index at the end of the volume, finding uh, these entries, basis, contango, uh, speculation, short skis, corn, and there was hardly anything. If there was something, this was just the barest, not even scratching, scratching the surface. So speculation is virtually ignored by conventional economic theory. The hurly-burly on the floor of the exchanges apparently does not reach the ears of the inhabitants of Ivory Tower. <laughs> In uh, about 1926, Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, wrote a short pamphlet with the title The Economic Consequences of Mr. Churchill. That's Winston Churchill, who was the the uh, secretary of the exchequer and the, practically the uh, finance minister of the of Britain, and one of his uh, more uh, dubious acts was the uh, rehabilitation of the gold standard in Britain in the year 1925, but this was completely mishandled and Keynes correctly predicted that it will collapse as it did in 1931 when uh, Britain, as a saying then, when went off gold, which was defaulted and defaulted fraudulently on its gold uh, commitments. <coughs> So that was the title Keynes gave to his pamphlet, The Economic Consequences of Mr. Churchill. Now, I would like to write a pamphlet with the title, The Economic Consequences of Mr. Keynes. <laughs> uh, I just gave you an, an outline, I have about 10 more minutes to go. Uh, what would be in that little pamphlet? the economic consequence of Mr. Keynes. <laughs> Keynes blamed the Great Depression on overproduction, uh, the uh, domino effect of, of uh, bankruptcies in industry, creating more and more unemployment, 
thereby undermining demand for goods and services. So this was a spiral, downward spiral. Once it started, it just continued until the economy fell flat on its face. And at the heart of the matter was the gold standard, because Keynes said the gold standard has a contractionist effect on the economy. It makes the economy contract rather than expand. Remove that, and then the economy will have no more fatter. It will just keep growing and will be happy ever after. Well, the economic consequences of Mr. Keynes were that rather than being a contractionist force, the gold standard was absolutely necessary for the proper functioning of the economy. And it was, in fact, the removal of the gold standard which was the chief cause of the uh, Great Depression, as I'm going to explain it now in a few words, because this is really, as I have said, a topic for a pamphlet. In 1933, the forcible removal of gold sent a message to bond speculators. Remember, there was virtually no bond speculator until the last few months before the collapse, before the uh, 1931 and 1933 attacks in Britain and the United States on the gold standard, because uh, there was not enough volatility in the bond market which would make speculation profitable and speculators knew that their, where their bread and butter would come from, would come from volatility. So the message was, here is your chance. You never had a chance before to bid bond prices sky high. Here it is now. Take it. Because gold has been removed. Gold, you should look at gold in this context, as the chief competitor to the government bond. The government bond <coughs> is an instrument for very conservative in investors, such as widows and orphans, for example, who are mentioned in the Bible. They ignore all kinds of possibilities to make huge profits, so they settle for a small interest which the government bond would pay them. And they have virtually no com competitor because industrial bonds and other bonds and other, uh, let's not even mention equities, industrial shares and what have you, all pay higher return, but in exchange for much greater risk. However, bonds, government bonds, still do have a competitor, ignored by most observers, and this competitor is gold. Because the most, the very, very most conservative in investors ignore that pittance which the government pays as interest. They would say, we don't want a return, we just want to be sure that we'll not be cheated, we'll not be victimized by, by uh, uh, fraudulent bankruptcy. So what happened? In 1931 in Britain, in 1933 in the United States, gold was forcibly removed 
from the arena as the chief competitor of gold bonds. And the only player in the arena left was the government bond. No competition. No competition. It, they won by default. All the money, all the money of widows, orphans, conservative investors, etc., had to go into government bonds. But the flip side of the price of the government bond, which was then increasing, is the rate of interest, which was decreasing. So in other words, the forcible removal of gold resulted in a collapsing rate of interest. The rate of interest appeared to be falling into the black hole of zero interest. That's what happened in the 1930s, and that's what seems to be happening now, especially when you look at Japan and the Japanese rate of interest. And although I am constantly challenged by others who say, no, this is hyperinflation, I say, well, it could be that certain <coughs> commodities such as energy and food are taken apart from the rest, but the main feature of our present situation is also the pull of the zero black hole, of the black hole of zero interest. Now this is a tall order. You have to explain, and I have four minutes left, uh, we can do justice to this, but I will be happy to take further opportunities during this uh, meeting, uh, during our lecture series, to talk about this, how the collapsing interest rate creates depression. And there will be two main ideas involved. One is the release of bond speculators. I don't consider speculators parasites, very far from it. But I just have to make that distinction between risks created by nature and risks created by man. And I don't call those speculators, well actually I have to because that's everybody, we, we wouldn't be able to communicate if I didn't call them bond speculators, but really they are gamblers. They are part of the casino where bonds are traded and they are gamblers. It's not the same as speculation. But anyhow, this was a force up to that point non-existent, all of a sudden released, released in the market, and they started bidding bond prices higher and higher, meaning the uh, bidding of interest rates lower and lower. That was one feature. But there was a second feature which was probably even worse than that. And this is my last thought, which I uh, give you, and I hope to return to this. And this is the open market operations of the central banks. This is a catchy phrase. It sounds good. Everybody hears that open market. Well, if it's open, it can, be, it can only be good. Because bad things happen when you do things underhanded. So, catchy phrase, but there are a couple of things to remember. Number one, open market operations, and that means in the bond market, central bank enters the open market and buys, sometimes sells, but mostly buys, government bonds. That's how they increase the money supply. So, there it is, the open market operations of the central bank were introduced in the 1920s in the United States by the Federal Reserve System. 
illegally. Because bad as the 1913 Federal Reserve Act may have been, that's another topic, but it did rule out government bonds, which were not a proper asset for the central bank. The Federal Reserve Act of 1913 was categorical in its rejection of the uh, monetization of government debt. There was just complete agreement at that time that this was a no-no. The central bank was not supposed to do that. So if they cannot do it through the main door, they are going to do it in the back door. And that's what they did. And it took 10 years before it was retroactively legalized. In the 1930s, they railroaded through uh, acts uh, of Congress which made it legal retroactively. Now remember, ex post facto legislation is usually bad, and it was very bad in this case. So these two things uh, should show you that indeed the uh, uh, unbridled speculation, I should say, gambling which was released was bad per se, but it was especially bad because it was done illegally, underhandedly, and uh, there was no limit. This could just go and go, go and go. There it is, 11 o'clock. On that thought, I finish. I just say these were the two areas which Gold Standard University wanted to address and go into very, very great details, and I'm sorry that it didn't come to that. We'll hope that uh, there will be other means, and I certainly plan to write on these topics. So uh, this will be circulated during the day, and uh, I hope you will read the rest. I could get about two-thirds of the way through, but there's a little more than that, there's a little farewell message, and I, uh, I'm i sorry that I ha have to start this session with a, an announcement, which is not a happy one for me, but there it is, and we'll see the future. Certainly, we are not going to give the fight up.